for this evening's talk. Just a topic just came up. It's about <coughs> the nature of the mind. We make a lot of comments and talks about the nature of the mind in Buddhism. But it's also the case that I started off my life as a materialist, a theoretical physicist. And it's one thing which when you wanted to try and find out and discover the nature of life. First of all, it's a theoretical pursuit, but find out that instead of just having ideas, how do you know if those ideas are true or not? You saw so many people arguing with one another, everyone thinking they're right and other people are wrong. And that was not inspiring at all. Why do people keep on arguing on really important things? And when you learn about the nature you know, of reality, even that, there's always, they used to call it in science, a ghost in the machine. The fact that you know, just stuff was not enough to actually to form this thing which we call life. I often mention this, that in our Western philosophy, I'm not going to stay with philosophy that long, in Western philosophy, they always credit the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, with getting the basic ideas of philosophy in place. And I wish they would actually believe that, because I don't know about you, but I remember just reading, you know, Aristotle and uh, Plato, and there was, oh, hey, I'm going to be a bit sort of scholastic, in Plato's Republic, one of his famous books, they had the last chapter in Plato's Republic all about rebirth. These guys, they were all into that because there's no way you can explain just you as if you were just born and created in, in just one life. Where did the Mozarts come from? Where did these little geniuses, you know, who were just almost like born with these abilities, come from? It has to be just more than the body and the brain. And of course there is much more than that. There is this thing which, you know, has been called the mind for such a long time. What we call the sixth sense. That's a nice theory. How can you prove it? And of course, you know, there is the way to prove it. And of course, that's what you do, what you were doing half an hour, uh, just five minutes ago, with the meditation. The meditation, you were letting go of the body. I don't know about you, but just my body just almost disappeared. You couldn't feel the feet or the legs or anything. That was all so relaxed it kind of disappeared. So all you had was just the peace, the stillness, and the joy of that stillness. Peace is not boring. Stillness is gorgeous. To prove the point, and just to be uh, not just Buddhist, but to do the, one of the quotes. I remember just having a discussion with some Catholic priests years and years and years ago, and I got out this quote, and that really disturbed them because they, they had to go and find it to check if I was right or not. And it's just really embarrassing for them when the Buddhist monk knows more about the Christian Bible than they do. And that was a little quote in Psalms saying, Be still and know that thou art God. Not experience it, know that you are that God. A powerful statement, but what does it mean? What it means is just, what is a God anyway? What would you, what would you imagine a God to be? I don't what, know what you were told, but some powerful, blissful, pure, perfect experience. And then, of course, you know, that's what it said there. What does it mean, though? That's just words. There comes a time when you meditate, each one of you, sooner or later, a lot of times more people than you'd expect. 
you're sitting down there and you get so still and so peaceful. Sometimes we say you bliss out. What does that mean? It means you're sitting down and just the body vanishes. So you can't feel the body anymore. And even the hearing disappears. And just you haven't gone unconscious. You're just going deep inside. In Buddhism we always talk about the six consciousnesses. So you know this yeah, they do talk about the six consciousnesses. But in particular they talk about just <coughs> the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and this six consciousness of mind. In Western philosophy or Western experience, you only have the five. Here we have like the six, as they had in Greek philosophy. But anyway, so it is Western. Greek was in the West. But anyhow, what it does mean is that once you get in contact with this and know the nature of your mind, everything else vanishes. You can know what this mind really is. It's one actually the sayings of the Buddha that if you want to know the nature of, say, gold, you have to purify the gold, first of all. Take away all the other elements, could be some tin in there, or silver, or iron. Purify it from all those other elements, so it's just gold, 100% gold, nothing else but gold. They can find out its nature, its properties. That's exactly what you do when you meditate. Sometimes you get so deep, it's not just about letting go of stress in life, it goes much deeper than that. Much more powerful and much more beneficial. You go so deep in this meditation, you get to understand what is this mind. Everything else vanishes, you just have a pure mind, peaceful, nothing else. And this is not what you've been told by people, it's not what you read in books, it's not what you've learned at some university class, is what is actually just happening in front of you. And I say this because when a person does get some lovely meditations, it's afterwards, you can know if it's a good meditation, because afterwards it's amazing just what you see and what you can hear. If you do hear sounds, you can really hear them for the first time. You know this is one of those things when people go on meditation retreats, we offer many meditation retreats here, we always make them, they're not free, they're always priceless. In other words, we don't get involved in money for these things. Uh, basically that means you don't pay if you don't want to. Lots of people make donations, but you don't have to. Because that is the purity of it. It's like diminishing it to sell meditation or truth like stuff in the marketplace. But this is something much more beautiful. And when you start to experience what this meditation is, it's like your mindfulness increases enormously. You can actually see things, you can understand things. And this is where, you know, even if you are on a retreat and we have like the lunch or the breakfast, it's amazing how many people start talking that, wow, the cooks at this retreat are the best cooks in the world. This was the first retreat I ever went on when I was a student at Cambridge. And I was just really concerned when I learned the retreat was being held in boarding houses for students with the cooks who were the people who usually cooked for students in UK. Now first of all, this was in the 60s. Number one, in the 1960s, like English cooking was not really that well respected. And I remember at that time, all it was was usually you know, meat and two veg. You know, other retreat was a vegetarian, but you know, vegetarian something and vegetables all boiled, boiled or steamed. So there was hardly any taste left in it at all. And I really thought that I'm not going to be able to last a nine-day meditation retreat. I was a young man with no decent food. So, what happened was that when I had my first you know, breakfast and lunches and no dinners, when we did a few of these, I thought, wow, this food is actually tasty. It was delicious. 
I thought it was just our good luck, good karma, that with all the boarding house cooks in the whole of the country, we managed to get one who could actually cook a lunch. But then afterwards, I realized that can't be the case, and it wasn't the case. The only reason was the cook was as bad as usual. It was just my mind was just so sensitive now, I could pick up all of the flavors. After all that boiling, all of those flavors had been just zapped or sucked away from that cauliflower. I could taste what was left and could magnify it. It was delicious. I never thought that was possible. What was happening? I was starting to see the power of the mind. Simple thing. Sometimes I don't know if you're into music, any of you. I wasn't a monk yet, but I remember just sometimes just getting so sensitive you can walk past some sort of recital or some sort of rehearsal. And when you hear that music, it was gorgeous. One of the other things which happened to me was just done that first retreat which I had the privilege of going to that I, we were allowed to have a walk for one hour every morning. And, you know, I didn't go very far, because it was close to the botanical gardens in Cambridge. All I did was actually, I thought it came a nice walk in the botanical gardens. That's easy enough. But then I got to the entrance. And at the entrance, I couldn't believe I saw the most beautiful clump of bamboo I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, you know, what's, what's a clump of bamboo doing there in this cold country? And it looked incredibly gorgeous. I kind of remembered that in Chinese watercolors, they often have bamboo featured in Chinese watercolors. Why? Just because the way they bend under their own weight and the colors, and they're not sort of strong, they're very soft. And it's just the way they bend, and even the leaves are also just you know, narrow and long. It's almost like sensuous. And when I saw that clump of bamboo, I thought, wow, that's gorgeous. And I'll tell the story quickly, because I did realize, had enough other presence of mind. If I just stood like that with my, eye, my, my mouth open, gaping in its gorgeous beauty, there's this young student gaping at a clump of bamboo for an hour. Somebody will call the men in the white coats and take me away. It's not the normal thing to do. And so, but anyhow, it was so gorgeous. I enjoyed every moment of it, but I saw a bench and I could sit down on that bench and act kind of normal. But that never went away from me. I had to tear myself away to go to breakfast. I went there the next day and the next day Eight of the nine days I went there. And it was, I never, never was finished with it. It satisfied me. It just uh, gave me some joy and pleasure which I'd never seen before. That was just a simple sight of a clump of bamboo. But then, you know, once the retreat was over, because this was the, the place I was studying at, I decided just to go and see my favorite clump of bamboo, the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world. I got on a bicycle and rode through the traffic. That's an important part of this story. Riding through traffic, stressing out. By the time I got to that same old clump of bamboo, it looked just so ordinary and out of place. It was bamboo and in a cold part of UK. It shouldn't be there. It was dry, desiccated, looked really sickly. And I thought, what had happened to the most beautiful clump, clump of bamboo in the world, which I could see only a couple of weeks earlier? Now it was gone. It was the same plant, physically the same. But what had happened is my mind was now tired. I could not see it to the same sense of beauty that I could see when I was in a meditation retreat. And I've experienced that just so often ever since, and I tell other people about that. 
First of all, when you start to develop your mind, you're not quite sure what it is yet, but you know it feels really nice, very good, very pleasant, very healthy, very free. You know, sometimes that when you meditate, hopefully you saw that a few times, no one had a cough. That's one of the reasons why, even though I had a cough the week before and the week before that, even though that I still gave talks, one of the reasons I did that to show what meditation can do to a cough, you know, the irritation just decreased. I didn't take any medication. It's a meditation, soften the mind, and just, it wasn't so much of a problem anymore. And that is kind of weird, but when you don't worry about things, when you make peace with them, of course healing happens. It's one of the most amazing things to actually to see and to experience for yourself. So, but anyway, it's also joyful as well. You know, sometimes, how many of you get depressed? You know, people have done um, experiments, and that's, experiments are just so coarse and so unrefined. They just you know, take a few readings how can they really know how you feel? They can just see what lights up here, what lights up there in your brain, but is that really just fair? Because you've got machines on you, sometimes you expect what you're supposed to report. But certainly that you know you see that after you've know how to make mind peaceful, you get a boost of energy. Not only clumps of bamboo look beautiful, not only if you go down to the river and just watch the, the water flow. Very nice now, we had a very heavy rainstorm in Serpentine a couple of days ago, actually only yesterday, yesterday morning. And now sort of got some water in the ground now. So we expect some grass to be coming up soon. That was so dry in Bodhinyana Monastery for, for months. But also when you can start to see the water start flowing, have you ever seen there's just the water dripping from the roofs? It's a gorgeous sound. I remember just going over into South Korea, one of these monasteries over in the in the mountains. It was like like a kung fu movie. Just the architecture and there's so much ice there, and the big river which ran th not a big river but like a stream which ran through the heart of that monastery. It was mostly iced over, but just a little bit had melted, enough to hear the water flowing. And the sound was better than just listening to a symphony. It was gorgeous. Why? A lot of times, it wasn't my ears, it was just a place, I'd just been doing some meditation there before. And once you do your meditation, it's like your ears become all cleaned up and enhanced and you can really appreciate you know what you are listening to you appreciate what you're feeling you can appreciate everything looks more uh, precise more full your mind is uh, charging up you know your five senses and then life does not look boring anymore that's one of the reasons why depression arises, simply because you've been there, seen that, done that, how many more things you'd need to do to stimulate through force those senses. Louder music, you know, more vibrant paints. Oh, this is one of the other weird things about what happens when you meditate. You know, the vibrancy of colors. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why when you get into nice deep states of meditation, you see these lights come up in the mind. And then they, we call them nimittas. It's you know, traditional, it's part of what happens when you meditate. But these lights which come up in the mind, the first time they come up, they blow you away. Simply because the nature of those colors is something you like you've never seen before. If it's a yellow, it's more yellow than any yellow you've ever seen. If it's like white, it's gorgeous white. Every color is like enhanced, purified, brighter. 
And that's usually the only way that I've heard to describe these things. More green than green. And this is not an exaggeration, this is what you see, and it's not through any um, drug or anything. You're seeing these by the power of your mind, not the power of your brain. And this is what happens, and this is where this whole path becomes very, very delightful and beautiful. I was about to mention this during the meditation we were doing, that when you get to the point of, okay, make peace, be still, what are you supposed to be watching then? What you can watch is the joy, the happiness of it. Because it gets really nice and blissful. And don't be afraid of that. Be a connoisseur of happiness. This is one of the things which, you know, as a monk, I keep talking about. And if you do your meditation, you as a Buddhist, a meditator, you get happier and happier and happier and oh, happier. And many people think that, what the heck are you talking about? You're a monk, you're not supposed to be happy. What are you talking about? I've been doing this for 50 years. If I didn't know what happiness was, I'd have got out of here a long time ago. People say, what, are you just sitting in your room all day? Can't you get a life? Oh, I will give up this life. <laughs> if I could give this life to you, I mean, I don't think you come out of your room either for days. Have a beautiful time. And it's not done through force. In meditation, you don't hold yourself still. You can't do that. That's one big mistake. If any of you try to meditate by keeping yourself still, or keeping all the thoughts out of your mind, or keeping all these ideas out. That never works, you're wasting time. Instead, just like as I was t teaching earlier, relaxing your body. You know how important that is, because too many people are, are tense. Okay, I haven't told a joke yet. Here you go, this is a terrible joke, but here it comes, <laughs> decided to say it. About the guy who went to the psychologist What's your problem? He said, oh, sometimes I'm sure I'm a TP. Sometimes I'm sure I'm a marquee. You know that syndrome in psychology? Psychologists got it straight away. Your trouble, sir, is you're too tense. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the groan will do, thank you. <laughs> and anyway, so why are people too tense? They're always trying to control, they can never do it. But what we do in meditation, oh, you've seen this many times before, here it comes again. How do you keep a glass of water perfectly still? Easiest thing in the world. Hold it, it never gets still. You get tired, you get worn out. Put it down and become still all by itself. Just be patient and that water will be more still than I can ever hold it. How much effort is that? Pretty still now, a little bit of movement, another minute or two and that would be totally still. That's how we meditate, we let go, renounce, stop controlling, let it be. And that's what we did with our body. What happens then, our body kind of disappears, it vanishes, but your mind is still very alert and strong. So you can actually know what it's like to be still. And that awareness of that stillness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And again, that result of that afterwards, your mind is really powerful. And you know, that's one of the reasons why, I usually only tell this on meditation retreats, that sometimes people come to me afterwards and they say, oh, the meditation was so deep, I got into one of these really deep states of meditation. You've got to be careful sometimes because people want that so much and it becomes like a personal achievement, which is wrong. These aren't achievements, these are where you tend to let go, where you disappear, you're not there anymore. But your awareness is there, very strong. So a lot of times when people come up and say this to me, I say afterwards, I say, I'm sorry, 
but Canadian women from Alberta cannot get into deep meditation. <laughs> She's from Canada. <laughs> She's been coming here for years. That's what I can say to her because she knows what I mean. If she got upset and angry and said, what are you talking about? That's misogynistic. That's racist. That this, that. If she replied like that, I'd realize she didn't have a good meditation. But when she was like this, just nice and peaceful and chuckling, I said, yeah, she's a good meditator. I don't mean you can't. We just say those things to try and get a response. Because if you've had a really nice meditation, you just can't get upset afterwards. It's impossible. Someone can call you stupid, an idiot, but you end up just laughing. Okay, a similar story, but this is more personal. Many years ago, I gave a talk, on, you know, just on general Buddhism, at Mercedes College, you know, the ladies' high school over in, uh, next to the cathedral in Perth. Yeah, I don't know why you laughed. That's not the joke yet. <laughs> the joke is coming in a moment. <laughs> and so it just happened, a fortunate coincidence, that having done a few talks, a few classes in Mercedes, I think it was a Catholic college for women, for girls. And anyway, the next day I was walking down St. George's Terrace. This is true, I'm not making this up. Walking down St. George's Terrace, going to another appointment somewhere, and... A few of the girls came past, you know, and they said, "Ah, oh, you're the monk who gave a talk in our school last yesterday." And my reply was, "Oh, I'm really amazed you remember me." And they said, "Oh, we'll never forget you." I thought, "How cute that is! They were never going to forget me." I didn't realize I gave such a good talk. I said, "How can we ever forget a monk whose name is Bra?" There's an M on the end. <laughs> but I thanked them for that because instead of getting upset, I thought, what a wonderful little true story and joke which I can tell people later on for many years afterwards. So that's actually what happens. When you get some nice meditation, it changes your character. You're peaceful. No one can upset you. You know, that really upsets other people when they can't upset you. <laughs> But nevertheless, that's their problem. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of times, this is actually gets you to know how to strengthen that mind of yours, how to make it really peaceful. And the other thing which I like to say about the nature of this mind is this is just ordinary things about how you can make use of it. Is and this is my background, but I always remember this guy over in Cambridge, Brian Josephson his name was. You can look him up if you wish to. He was Welsh. He was also a physicist. He got a Nobel Prize for in inventing basically what's called quantum tunneling, which basically made supercomputers possible. So he got a Nobel Prize for that. But you know how he discovered that? He did all his research and all his formulas and stuff, but then the breakthrough came when he was meditating. When he came out of meditation, all the solutions just came up to him. How many Australians have got Nobel Prizes? A couple. We should get some more. We should start teaching more meditation in Curtin University in uh, Murdoch University, in UWA. Why not? You can feel how it works. You, your mind becomes clear and powerful and penetrating. That's just worldly stuff. But it's pretty, pretty good to be able to get a Nobel Prize. Not just a Nobel Prize, oh, this story. Here we go, this is a long time ago I've told this one because this happened in 2000. Sydney Olympics. 
in knowing the Sydney Olympic Games in New South Wales. The New South Wales government made sure there was like leaders from all the major religions there to serve the athletes. This was a high stress situation. And they even had a monk in there. He was actually a Thai monk who I knew. So he was in the village, the Olympic village, Homebush Bay, I think that's what it was called, and just if anyone needed him. And he said, this was actually printed in, I think, the uh, Sydney Morning Herald or something, it was one of the things which happened during the Olympic Games. He said that one day, these three people came to see him, mother, father, and daughter, from Eastern Europe somewhere. Their daughter had unexpectedly got into the finals of one of the track events. <laughs> Whoever's laughing like that, I like you very much because it's not even funny, but you laugh. <laughs> got into the finals. Now imagine that was you. You know, you exceeded your expectations. You're in the final of the Olympic Games. And you'll be on the TV the next day or next couple of days in front of you know, all your family and friends and people from your home country cheering you on. That is really high stress. And so because of that, she wasn't able to sleep. And she, even her training was all over the place. She was overly excited. So the parents uh, took this girl to see the monk. You know, you know meditation. It's one of the things which monks are well known for. You know, we can teach meditation. Can you please teach our daughter how to relax enough to sleep at night? So we gave her some instructions on meditation. He didn't know what happened next. He didn't watch TV. And in those days, we don't have internet. We can't find out what the latest news is. So what happened was that he didn't know what had happened, what had occurred, except he wrote, or in an interview, that he saw in the Olympic village these three people coming towards him again. Uh, the mother, the father, and the athlete in between. They were smiling, big grins on their face. So he knew something good must have happened. And as they came closer, as he described it, the girl in the middle was waving something on a string. <laughs> what do you think that was? A medal. When they came closer, he could see the color. Gold. And they come to say thank you. Thank you for teaching our athlete daughter how to relax so much that when it came to the finals of these Olympic Games, she managed to win the gold medal for her country. It's one of those true stories. <sighs> how many gold medals has Australia won? When's the next Olympics? It's in Paris, isn't it? You know, I think they should, anyone who knows anybody in the sports industry, I think they should offer me a business class ticket to go to Paris to teach you. <laughs> With an attendant. <laughs> to teach the Australians how to win more gold medals. It's just getting that inner power, that stillness, that peace inside to be able to do this. So those are some of the byproducts, but it's also knowing what this actually mind really is. So things like depression and negativity, getting upset, and just being able to almost exceed expectations and to really appreciate the world. Sometimes people get negative about this world. You can't do that when you're meditating. Now, honestly, how many of you have tried to upset me, or seen other people trying to offend me. Have they succeeded? <laughs> Why? I wasn't born like this. <laughs> uh, 
It's literally because you can get so peaceful, so calm, that when somebody tries to say some stupid things to you, you just burst out laughing. You can't get upset. So, any of you partners who come here, you're having a difficult time getting to understand each other. What can you do? Really get into this meditation business. Because when you're very sensitive, you can pick up all the f things which the other person you're living with is trying to say. It's not the words which come out of their mouth. How many people would love to say something, but it just doesn't come out? Or they feel afraid of what they're going to say. Or they choose the wrong time. When you are very aware, <laughs> peaceful, and you've got a very strong penetrating mind, it's amazing sometimes what you can say. Just the right thing at the right time. Okay, this was just uh, Leha. She has to go back earlier, but she usually looks on the, the website. She was telling me that many years ago, what really sort of impressed her once was when uh, she asked me about how to bring up children. I've never had kids. <laughs> Obviously, I've been a mug all my life, well, most of my life. So, how, what do I know about raising children? But then when she asked, when there's a question, I think, here many years ago, Ajahn Brahm, give some advice, how to raise kids as Buddhists? They were asking. And I just said something very simple. Please teach your kid, number one, to always ask questions. And number two, to be honest. That's all. She remembered that for years. Simple answer. But very deep. The honesty meant that commitment to truth. That means that you know you won't try and deceive yourself or deceive others. And the casting question was how you can find that truth. If you're not satisfied, ask another question. And eventually that not having a theory you're trying to prove, but having this wonderful quest and understanding how to find the truth. And they said, and that's if Buddhism is worth anything, then that's what you'll find. If it's wrong, then you won't you find it's wrong. That's the most important that confidence you have. Always ask the questions and don't stop until you can find what to you, you can feel, you can know is truthful. And that commitment to truth is important. And that's the same thing with even in relationships you have, husband and wife. I don't know how many people, you hide truths from your partner. You're afraid what they might say if they found out. Never do that. You know, two people should always be able to trust each other is those people who are partners. That's one of the things which one of my jobs, I have all amazing jobs, not just teaching meditation or teaching Buddhism, but actually blessing marriages when people get married. And that's sometimes, I ask them, why on earth do you choose me to give you a marriage blessing? Of course, they say, because it works. It's a very sensitive, difficult thing to do to commit yourself to a partner. One of the things, say, look, please, the two of you, always be honest with each other. But to encourage that honesty, you must always, if you commit together, you must always have this, what we call like amnesty. How can you be truthful if you're afraid of the consequences? So amnesty means, you know, if your wife tells some silly thing she's done, then just forgive her. Otherwise she won't tell you anymore. It's been a courageous thing for her to say that. And it's the same with 
the husband, if, if he says something which he'd rather not have done, it's great that you say that. And then there's a sense of trust together and you can get help. Husband and wife actually working together, showing their love. Your partner in life will never be perfect because you're not perfect. <laughs> no one is perfect. We're here to grow together. Not expect to be perfect. We have to admit some of our mistakes and have that forgiveness and help each other become better human beings. It's amazing how you can grow like that. And this is actually where you can be sensitive. You're not trying to hide anything. So always be honest. Ask questions. If you ask the question, give the best answer you possibly can. Be truthful. Sometimes monks ask that question or nuns. So we're not ready to give talks yet or teach meditation. What are you talking about? Of course you are. Well, there's so many, many things we don't know. Great, be honest. Somebody asks you a deep question, so you don't know. Honestly, if, if somebody said that and they were honest, would you respect them or would you walk out of the room? Of course you'd respect them. They're being honest. And how many honest people do you see in this world? <laughs> Not that many are there. Even in religions, we're supposed to be spiritual, truthful. But it's nice to be honest, so you've got no fear at all. So that's the sorts of things which, uh, how to teach kids and how to have marriages being successful. What on earth does a Buddhist monk know about that? I've been in his road for 50 years. You know that because you know your mind. This mind is just... Yes, it is 45, yes, correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for for proving the point there. You can't offend me. <laughs> so, this is actually how we can learn what the nature of the mind is, and it's not just a theory. It has all sorts of other aspects to it, like you know what rebirth is. And I don't know if your partners together. Why? Why do the two of you get drawn together? Have you ever figured that one out? Why there's such a thing as like even love at first sight? Look, there's this couple once, I think they were the, the most weird. Weird, but not really. Because they came on one of my nine day retreats. They were good Buddhists, good meditators, but they couldn't keep apart. We have our rules, you know, that you know, you're supposed to live in, uh, stay in separate rooms, and yeah, you, can, you can smile at each other, but you don't need to talk to one another or hold hands or anything, but they couldn't stop themselves. And they just came up to, you know, they were honest, they said, we can't do anything about this. Because for the first time they met, I think it was in some retreat over in France or somewhere, and she came up to him and said, your name is David, and gave the surname as well. He never seen her before. Imagine someone does that to you. He said, "This is your name, and I've met you before." And they had this incredible attraction together. And he said that this was we were married in a previous life. And it's obviously true because they were really, really close together. Would that be a bit weird? I only tell stories like that because you know this story. My auntie, who is amazing, she's still alive, she's 96 or 97 or something. And when she was out just looking for a partner in life with my mother, my mum and her like, grew up together. They weren't sisters, they were cousins, but they were just like sisters. So one evening they went out, before they went to a dance, they went to see this medium. Just something to do. And this medium looked at my auntie and told her, he said, you're soon going to meet the love of your life. Oh yeah, you've heard that one before. And his name will be Donald, surname Wolfries. That's not like Jack Smith or, you know, a, you know John this or... 
It was a really weird name, Donald Wolfries. A couple of days later, she went to a dance with my mum. They went there together. And this guy came up to my auntie and said, we'd like to dance. That's what they used to do in those days. And yeah, he was, they were attracted together. And so what's your name? Donald. Oh, no. <laughs> Wolfries. And they were married for 60 years. He only died a few years ago. She's still going strong. And every time I used to ask her, you know, this is family. They don't lie to you. No reason to. Did that really happen? Oh, yeah, it did. What did you feel afterwards when you met him? That was strange, but it all worked out fine. That kind of shocked me. How did you know that? But it worked. So this mind... You know, when that happens in your own family, it just adds to the evidence, this is real. Life is weird and it can only happen if there's a thing called the mind. And that mind goes from life to life, or it just changes a little bit as it goes through. It's called dependent origination, that's a deep talk. But that's actually what motivates and why you come here. Often I sort of, and people ask me, how come you became a Buddhist, let alone a Buddhist monk? No one in my family in London could spell Buddhist. There was no one who was a Buddhist in my family. And how come I just became a Buddhist monk and liked it so much? Wow. Is that, is that, oh, you obviously know why. This can't be your first time as a Buddhist monk. You're inclined towards that. You're pulled towards it. I'm not just saying this because this uh, wonderful yet new monk, he's only been ordained for one day. Yesterday, he ordained as a full monk with three others, four monks. We had a big ordination together. And I was telling them my story. When I ordained as a bhikkhu, as a monk, so he knows, as a samanera even, I would wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare. It was in Bangkok. Honest, true. I told many people this. My nightmare, in the middle of the night, I'd open my eyes with a nightmare. My nightmare was that I was a lay person. And I'd open my eyes and look at my robes folded neatly next to my mat on the floor. I'm a monk. I'm a monk. I can't even convey to how much joy that gave me. I'm really a monk. And I closed my eyes and went into a nice deep sleep and woke up in the morning. And that happened the next two nights as well, three nights in a row. How on earth could that happen? It's something you knew deep inside of you. It's almost like destiny. Something was putting towards you. That can only happen with the power of the mind. It had nothing to do with my body at all. Very much the power of the mind. Okay, I can keep going because I've got energy today and inspired myself. I hope you enjoyed it. But we usually have some questions now. I know Eddie was trying to <laughs> clap a lot of time. If you want to do it, do it. <laughs> so any questions from the floor here? Any questions somebody has? Oh, go on, Eddie. Yeah, go on. Ajahn Brahm, it's, I don't know whether people realize or not, no? you mentioned about the mind, today's talk, the, the nature of the mind, it's very, in the Buddhist teaching, it's the heart of the teaching. You know? yeah. The power of the mind, and how the mind heals us, you know, you know, you know suffering, and the and understanding suffering, and how we get rid of suffering, you know, like you're, like you, when you're saying, you had a toothache, and the toothache went away. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Ajahn Brahm, 
You know, I um, last week remember not, I, I, I'll talk, tell you about the mind and the subconscious mind. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then um, two days ago, when this Ajahn Vimoka came here, you know, oh, yeah. he talked the same thing. You know, while he was talking, I was thinking of you. You know, your toothache all the time. So I can see it so clearly that, 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 you know, how our mind, you know, you're saying let go. When we completely let go, you know, okay, the thing, you know, okay, we, we don't think of, that's, sorry, the mind is, is what we think outside. Subconscious mind involves our feeling, you know, okay. Yeah. The pain from you is, you, you, from the subconscious mind, you let go completely, it goes off. Indeed. You know it, is it Ajahn Brahm? Yeah. Even this we could apply Ajahn Brahm to cancer and all these things too, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, you, you see it, I know you, you know it, Ajahn Brahm. I know you know it. And the reason why I'm saying is that this thing, okay, you, you, you give a good talk, you know. And I'm thinking of the, why I'm talking, you know, I think of the people here, you know. You know, not like a, what I'm saying is I thought of the people, maybe we can elaborate to let them understand. And when I talk, it's deeper so that the people can understand, you know, you know what, what we are talking about, you know. Oh, yeah. You know, maybe Ajahn Brahm, what do you think? We should be, we should be um, instead of just having just one thought on mind, you can concentrate it, you know, have it, maybe bring it more often on mind? We try to do that. Instead of all other topics too, just more on this, because it's the important thing, you know. This is our, the Buddha, our suffering and how we, we, we end our suffering. It's so suffering well, you know. And our sickness, like the cancer, all these things, is been put in you, your mind, you know, and then you die because you think you, you have cancer, you're going to die, this thing already. Yeah. And also the other thing, Ajahn Brahm, is the scientists, you know, they, they did a research a few years ago. I don't know how, you know. Maybe they should, they should talk to the Theravada monks you know, on this yeah. thing, you know. Sorry. Yeah, okay. You see, the, yeah, the, yeah. the people they they don't understand. They think I'm 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 talking oh, no. too much. No, it's okay. It's, yeah, it, you know that. It's very nice you give me a chance uh. to rest my voice for a minute or two. <laughs> so thank you. He's asking but whether I'm asking a question you. or what this thing is. Eh? Yeah, mm -hmm. we have to give others a chance as well to ask a question if they have one to ask. But it's perfect. Thank you, Eddie. Well, then no one wants to ask a question. <laughs> Is there some on the machine? Yeah. Good to see you. How are you doing? Okay. Okay, well, this is tonight. Over 1,400 people tuned in. And there were greetings and salutations from Spain, the Netherlands, Finland, the UK, Ireland, Malaysia, Australia, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, Bolivia, Poland, Ireland, Mexico, Germany. It's amazing how many people listen to this. And uh, to be honest with you, sometimes if they send me um, sort of compliments or comments, they always say thank you also to Eddie. You're well known throughout the world now. <laughs> no, honestly, that, but they thank you. Well done. Yeah. Can I say something? Um, and, uh, well, can you wait for a moment? Because I've got four or five questions here. From Amsterdam, first of all. What is the best way to deal with feelings of fear and anxiety with the help of meditation? The mind gets so strong that after a while the anxiety, fear just don't exist in you. Just in one simple meditation. This was my preceptor who was, I thought he was a study monk. But one day he told me about when he was training in Gotsamoy as a young monk. This was maybe 80 years ago. His teacher told him to meditate in a coconut grove, and when he came out of meditation, he found there was a big snake caught up in his lap. Because, you know, when you go into meditation, the body kind of disappears, and when the body came back again, there was a big snake, and he recognized that that was a really dangerous snake, very venomous. But he said he had no fear at all. 
And it was amazing, he said. That's what he noticed more than anything. The absence of fear when you had a big snake caught in your lake, in your lap, and it was really dangerous. And so he just carried on meditating for another 15 minutes, and then the snake decided to get up and go and just crawled away. He said, it's the weirdest experience, the absence of all anxiety and fear. That's what happens, you don't have fear. Obviously we know that fear is not a useful uh, reaction. The more fear you have, the more likely that snake is going to bite you. So anyway, he said that was weird, but it's a wonderful thing. In Kazakhstan, in every meditation we let go of the past and future, relaxing every part of the body with kindness. At what point do you need to move on to the actual observation of breathing? You never move on to the actual observation of breathing. The observation of breathing just happens. The breath comes to you. You don't go to it. After a while, when everything else starts to disappear, the breath is the last thing left moving. So you become aware of it quite naturally. And then you don't keep your awareness on the breath. After a while, even the breath vanishes. Keep your awareness on just what's happening right now and the joy of it. From Georgia. There is huge civil unrest in my country, people versus the government. The mind has angry and violent thoughts I can handle, but sitting peacefully feels isolated and passive. Please advise. You know, that's one of the most amazing things you can do to actually to sit down and be peaceful because that empowers your mind afterwards to be able to have fearlessness and also things like forgiveness. And every time I've tried this in violent situations, no one has ever been able to hurt me. It's weird. Even as one of these monks, the reason he became a monk, he's a very good friend, he's over in the UK, I think you may know him, Venerable Karunika. He's quite senior now. He told me what happened to him. He was, he was uh, doing martial arts, I think karate, and about, I think it's, he was already second black belt, second Dan black belt, but he was doing this fight with a female. You know, both were second Dan black belts. So this was serious stuff. And then as they were fighting, you know, just the sport, he got into this state of stillness and he dropped his guard. And she started hitting him, a second Dan black belt karate um, lady. And she hit him and hit him and hit him. Not that nothing hurt, but no even bruises afterwards. With no defense. He said that was such a strange experience. Because of the deep stillness he was experiencing at that time, he could not be hurt, not even bruised. This is actually sometimes the power of that mind. And to really get into it, you don't know how powerful it is. Other things, getting worried, and then you're just part of the problem. You're not a solution at all. Uh, from Poland, dear Ajahn Brahm, I am an autistic person, and I would like to selflessly help people like you. However, I have problems with communication, and sometimes I don't know if I should go to someone so as not to upset the person. I wonder if sometimes the desire to help is enough to gain positive karma. Of course, it's, it's uh, wonderful to do, and it's a great, a great way of making positive karma. But also, the world does change. And sometimes autism is not a thing, it's an autism spectrum. And you're not always autistic. Please don't let those labels confine you. There are times, you wrote this, which is perfect, it's wonderful. And don't let that define you. There are times when you're not autistic, there are times when you're very autistic. It's the same person, but different ways of how the body and the mind react. If you can really get into the meditation, really get into the mind, I know I'm going to get into trouble for this, but the autism just kind of gets so weak. Your mind is much more powerful. There was this guy, a BBC documentary I remember seeing. He wasn't autistic, but he'd lost his memory. 
And it wasn't very helpful because he just got married for the second time. And his new wife, you know, he'd just been married a couple of weeks. And then you can't remember who the heck she is. It's not very nice for the w new wife. And anyway, they gave him hyp hypnosis. And they found out that he was in his workshop in the back of his house. And then the telephone rang, the old telephones, not the mobiles. And he ran out and he hit his head on one of the open shutters. And that knocked his memory out. And under him, he could remember everything. That's how he found out the cause. He could remember his wife and everything. No problem at all. And they gave him the post-hypnotic suggestion. When you come out of hypnosis, you remember everything. They took him out of hypnosis. He couldn't remember a thing. But the point was that you know it was still showing that that memory was still there. He just could not access it except through meditation, uh, through hypnosis. So, keep on going, don't give up. Okay, Frank from Ireland. Dear Ajahn, did the Buddha ever explain why mankind always makes the same mistakes over and over again? Instead of, you know, that's when I was a school teacher. I noticed in like grade six, grade six kids always make the same mistake every year. Because it's new people going into grade six. The old grade sixers, once they learn the lessons, then they go to grade seven. They go on, further on. Humankind. Once we learn from our mistakes, we don't have to be reborn as a human being in crisis zones anymore. In our next life, we'll be in a much more peaceful zone, or even in the heaven realm. I don't know. It's not the same people. So human beings... Some of us do that. So we never have to experience that again. Okay. This is what happens. So we always seem to have the same things come back every couple of decades. Wars and conflicts. It's not the same people. Sometimes different lands. Sometimes di always different people until we learn. We don't need to do that anymore. It's amazing just how uh, stupid people are. They always have to think that the next time we can actually win a war. No one ever wins a war. That would be craziness. It caused so much suffering. Anyway, <coughs> I should actually finish off now. It's five past nine. I did four or five questions. Okay, quickly. Pearly Lau from Malaysia. Is there a prayer or chant that we can do for our loved ones when we see them going through a challenging period in their lives? You just give them loving kindness in whichever way you can. So say yeah, you're going through challenging period, periods in your life, but you're never alone. You've got people who love you and care for you. And just that kindness, that relaxation of, of the mind, I care about you. Never underestimate that power. Okay, I'd better finish off now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was very nice. Okay, I get the message. <laughs> thank you very much. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, I'm going to bow three times now to the Arahang Samasa Buddha. <laughs> Arahang Sama Sambodo Bhagawa Bodang Bhagawanta Abiwa Demi Suakato Bhagawata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Ami